Hi everyone. Hi. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Yes. Good. What a joy it is to be here with my, my wonderful friends and these gorgeous, gorgeous people. Yeah. I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, so my name's Sana. Uh, I'm a liberation psychologist. I'm a poet, uh, educator. Um, and we are here with the wonderful, wonderful Lama Rod Owens. Some noise for Rod. Yeah, gosh, what to say about Rod? <laughs> Rod is one of the really, really one of the most influential, influential thinkers of our time. Um, an incredible... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not even guessing it, though. Seriously. I just... <laughs> I, yeah, I've just, come off, I've just come off retreat with Rod. Um, we've just been on a silent retreat, and um, really, it's, it's hard to put in words the embodied movement that really Rod has offered for all of us that were in that space, and how opened my heart is from being in space with Rod and with Rod's teaching, um, not just in retreat, but through Rod's writing, through Love and Rage, by the book, it's here. <laughs> um, Radical Dharma. Yeah. Rod is, Rod is an incredible person and a blessing to us all. Um, as is Nova. Yeah, yeah we love Nova. <laughs> yeah, what a joy it is to be in, in space with you, Nova, and to have worked with you, to know your incredible work, and also doing really, really transformative liberatory work at the moment with your writing, with The Good Ally, which is also here, get the book. Um, yeah, speaker, thinker, all of the wonderful things that you offer us, um, both of you offer us with your generosity, with your labor, with your giving. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. You are choosing to be here on your Fridays. It could be many, many places, but you're here to really do this intentional work of dropping into what the practice of freedom means, what it means to actually do this work of healing, what it really means to do the work of getting free, right? In an hour. You ready, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Um, before we start, I just want to say a really quick piece about Dana. Um, you know, I've just named here generosity, how much, how much giving is happening. And dana in Sanskrit means generosity of heart, right? Rod and Nova here are doing so much, so much giving, not just here in space today, but in the work that they do for us all continuously. Um, and I think there's something really about leaning into the practice of giving as a part of this work of getting free, right? Really trusting abundance that we have enough and that we can, as a piece of care, do this giving for each other, right? That isn't just financially, you know, whatever that looks like, being able to give and receive care. Um, and with that, just really inviting you to lean into that practice of giving today in Dana. There are QR codes that you can scan to 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 give to both teachers today. And I just want to say as well that ne none of us are being paid to be here, yeah? This is all purely from the work of generosity. So just really acknowledging that. Um, yeah. Sh should we get into it? Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> how are you both? Let's start there. How are, you, how are your hearts? Uh, my heart is open and full. Um, yeah. It's been a a very extractive week as a black woman in the front line of this work. Mm. And when I knew this was at the end of the week, I was like, my goodness, mm. divine intervention. So um, I feel very nourished and resourced today. My heart is open. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Nova. How are you doing, Rod? I would say very similarly. Um, mm. Just really open feeling nourished, but also, you know, still holding, you know, the weight uh, of living in the world right now, mm. you know, um, but feeling grateful at the same time that I'm able to share the space and to, to choose um, 
to choose to help mm -hmm. right now. Um, so, and I'm so happy to be here with Nova and Lasana. It's just like friends, Kiki, you know, but, <laughs> but I'm gonna keep it short tonight. <laughs> <laughs> We've been out to lunch today. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a couple of cocktails in yeah. to this a right couple, now. A couple. So, you know, y'all are family already. <laughs> That's how many cocktails I've had. So. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's let's drop into love. Should we start there? Love is such a key part of both of your work, right? Yeah. It's really, really central to this work of, of getting free, yeah. disrupting systems of whiteness, mm -hmm. activism, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. right? And I know that both of you are really shaped by Bell Hooks' writings and thinkings, you know, and she often describes love as an action, yeah. right? This doing, this yeah. verb. Could you say a little bit about what the doing of love really looks like in this work of getting free, um, in this work of activism. But also, not just on an individual level, mm -hmm. right? What does it really mean collectively? Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole third part to this, yeah? <laughs> does, is there something also about how this work might look different for white folks uh -huh. and for people of a global majority, for black folks, for brown folks? Mm -hmm. We're both processing. <laughs> well, yeah. I just, there's a lot. There's a lot in that question. I don't know if I'm going to get to all of it. Um, but what is love? Love is, for me, this basic wish, desire for everyone to be safe and free and happy. But it's not just this wish for other people. It's first and foremost a wish for myself. Um, and so when I think about collective care, it means that I am extending the love that I have for myself to all others around me because I realize that everyone deserves to be free regardless of how much I don't like you. <laughs> you know, and that's, the, that's what love is. Like I have to push through my dislike of you and say that like you deserve the resources you need to be well, you know? Um, because maybe you're the way that you are because you didn't have access to the resources that you needed, right? And maybe you're expressing this violence because you're, there's something that's lacking. And if I am extending this wish for you to be further cut off from resources, then I am contributing to the violence, you know, that you're adding to the world, expressing to the world. So I'm not interested in that because love doesn't compel me to be an agent of violence. Um, and in terms of you know, what this work looks like for, depending on where we come from, in terms of whiteness and being outside of whiteness, you know, for me, I, 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 for me, for my teachings, I understand that we have to love everything if we're interested in getting free. Mm -hmm. So love means acceptance. Acceptance means I need to start telling the truth about where I come from and what I've been participating in, you know? And to tell the truth means that we allow our hearts to break, you know? And I think for white folks, you have to let your hearts break, you know? Um, and then take the risk of what it means to wade through that brokenheartedness, to begin to disrupt your participation in the system of privilege, right? And for from, you know, for people of color, black and brown people, it means that like we actually have to start taking care of a brokenheartedness that we're already connected to, mm -hmm. you know, tending to it, you know, um, and then asking for the resources we need to be well, you know, um, and maybe sometimes a largely divesting from the ways in which we're trying to caretake white people and reinvesting that energy in collective care for ourselves, you know, because we can't get free until we heal, but that's everyone we're healing. So, I'll stop there. Oh, a part of me just wants to be in the audience and absorb it. I have to talk now. Um, 
yeah, I needed, I needed time for that before something emerged. And so for me, in terms of, you know, whatever language we call it, activism, liberation, work, anti-racism, for me, you know, everything about white supremacy and racism was built on a foundation that is the opposite of love. So in, in this work, has to, love has to be at the centre of it. And sometimes what I find is when I'm speaking about love and, and people who, you know, the global majority black folk who are, black folk in particular, who are consistently on the receiving end of what is not love, what is anti-blackness, when they hear me talking about love or compassion in this way, they sometimes misunderstand that as bypassing and not holding people accountable. But for me, love for us in particular, black folk, brown folk, people in the global, major global majority, is about turning it inwards first. If you've been exposed to the programming that tells you you are less than, whether you consciously believe that to be true or not, then first and foremost, it's about, it's about self-love. It's about holding firm boundaries and saying, no, I will not allow you to harm me in that way. And that is unacceptable. And I can do that in, in integrity and with grace, but I'm centering myself first. And that's something that I didn't do for decades. I would fawn and I would people please and I would be caretaking whiteness and, and tending to the needs of white people ahead of my own. And not just white people, family, everyone else but me. So in, in terms of that love and that activism, it has to start, especially for people in the global majority, inwards. Um, because it allows us to stand in our power. It allows us to say no without feeling like you need to give an explanation. It allows us not to fear being disliked. Um, and I think that love looks, it, it does look different. You know, our work in this work for people who are racialized as white and for people who experience racism, it, it's different. Um, but it's the same. We have to look at the parts of ourselves that aren't pretty or that we hide and pretend aren't there. Like you say, we have to tend to the heartbreak in order to heal, otherwise we won't heal. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, there's, there's something in this piece on boundaries, our edges, that we're, that we're dropping into here. Um, this holding of humanity at the center, that we can will for another person's freedom, for them to have the resources that they need. But when they're harming us, we still hold on to this, right? That's, th that's your position that we, that this is the work of freedom, yeah. is to hold that desire, even in the face of harm. Yeah. And I guess there's something about this piece that I often struggle with, was, is in practical terms, right? What does, that, what does that really look like if we have to maintain relationship? Because so many of us often do in workspace, you know, with not just white folks, you know, whoever it is that is perpetuating that harm. Mm -hmm. How do we maintain relationship? How do we maintain a sense of community um, or this idea of a collective liberation whilst being attuned to our edges, whilst not compromising the love for ourselves? What does that actually look like? I think it's courage. It requires honesty and courage um, to say, you are hurting me, please stop. Because by doing that and centering your needs in that moment, again, with grace and, and with dignity, is that there is a risk of further harm. Mm -hmm. And there, especially if it's an intimate relationship, there is a risk of that relationship severing. So, for me, it, courage has to be a huge part of that. Um, and also, I ask my questions, I'm like, I'm constantly, constantly holding boundaries. That's part of my healing journey mm -hmm. as somebody who fawn, fawns a lot as a, a, a reflexive response. Some of that is a trauma response to mm -hmm. try and preserve and stay safe and well. Mm -hmm. My instinct is to please, please and serve. 
So my lesson is to lean back. And so I'm constantly being tested with holding boundaries and like, am I treating this person with dignity and respect? And if the answer to that is yes, then I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not being liked. Because this is the work. It requires intimacy and intimacy requires honesty. And I'm not going to abandon myself or self-sacrifice anymore. There's a clear line for me now. And I want that for everyone. Absolutely, so beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I'm so having fun. a great time. I uh, know. <laughs> I would say you should write a book. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna focus now. Um, yeah, I. You know, wisdom comes up for me. You mentioned courage. I think wisdom is a really beautiful partner with this work around boundaries. It's getting clear about stuff, you know. And what I'm evoking now is, uh, is Anita Baker. Um, you know, I like to evoke our, our wisdom philosophers, you know, when she says, I'm giving you the best that I got, you know. But that, for me, is a teaching that says that everyone doesn't deserve the best that I have, mm. you know, because people have to earn that. And that, that's about vulnerability. So when I enter into spaces and there's violence happening, I have to say, you know what? I need to protect myself. And I need to protect other people because they may get the, the, the worst of what I got. <laughs> you know? And I'm not trying to make those choices right now. You know? And so to, to establish boundaries is to say, you know what? I need to protect something right now because you are not earning the right to hold, you know, this piece of me. And I want us to have space to understand how to come back together, you know, in this holding space for each other, mm -hmm. you know? Um, if that doesn't happen, then often, you know, there's violence happening. There's a depletion for those of us who have been taught to caretake and to, to um, decenter our needs. Right, And then there's the violence of those of us who are constantly centering our needs above other people's needs, creating the conflict to begin with, right? So the wisdom of saying, you know what, like, what do I have to give in this moment and who's earned this? You know, there's always going to be love there because this is what it's based on. I, I love you, but I also love me. You know, both of those are happening at the same time, right? And so I'm making choices for both of us in the same moment. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, that work of really actually the foundation of it, loving ourselves, is rooted in believing we are deserving, right, of actually doing that work in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think this is so heavily shaped by our traumas that we've lived through. Um, where we believe the lie so often that we are not deserving of love, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So this piece around actually doing this recognition yeah. that we are deserving, yeah. what does that work look like? Yeah. Well, I think part of it is believing that I am a person. And for many of us surviving systematic violence and oppression, we, we, our agency to be a person has been severely erased, you know? So we need to, that love is actually reestablishing my right to be here in the world, my right to take up space, my right to, to have the things that I need to be well. You know, I need to be a person, not an other. You know, and that otherness is how systematic oppression perpetuates itself, you know. Um, but for me, you know, I would say for me and, and in my practice, yes, it was all of that, but it was also asking myself, don't I deserve to be happy? You know, I grew up, you know, in the, in the American South, you know, there was a lot of violence, you know, racialized violence. And... I grew up looking at white folks. I'm like, why do they get to have everything? You know, and that's what actually drove me into Dharma and Buddhism, because I was raised to believe that I wouldn't get what I needed until I died and went to heaven. 
And I was like, it sure as hell looks like some people are enjoying heaven right now. <laughs> you know, so if they get to enjoy heaven, you know, I can choose that for myself. And that has driven the work around liberation. It's like this being cut off from the resources that I need to be well is just an illusion that I've bought into. And so self-love says that I deserve. I deserve to be well. I deserve to be healthy. I deserve not to be a continuous survivor of racial violence, you know? And just naming that for myself and, and just saying, you know what, I, I'm here. You know, I'm here and I deserve to be here. And all the ways in which you're trying to retaliate against me because you believe I don't deserve to be human, that's your problem. Like, that's an expression of your difficulty to hold space for your deep insecurity. You know, I don't have to take that on anymore. And, but that's love for both myself and others around me. You know, just to be. And, and believe I have a right to be. That's all love is for me in this case. Yeah. It makes me think of um, one of your teachings from, from a tweet that the work of kind of befriending ourselves is also the recognition of our divinity and, you know, being this delicate flower that really yeah. needs a delicate tending to, a soft hand, right? Yeah. Not a gripping and a plucking at and, you know, how can we really be in relationship to ourselves with this, with this softening? Yeah. yeah, well, I'll, I'll just add on to that yeah, because yeah. That's, that's part of the image that I started introducing is that, like, I am a delicate flower, mm. right? And before, that was a joke. I was just, like, walking around, I'm just this delicate flower, and I'm just, like, so sensitive. Like, I'll just wilt when it gets too hot, and, you know. <laughs> but, you know, um, but no, like, I had to, like, step into that and say, you know what, I deserve to be handled gently, with kindness and care. I'm this delicate, rare, beautiful flower, right? And this also has helped me to disrupt these conditionings around patriarchy, you know, that says that I am not gentle and delicate and vulnerable, that I'm rough and rigid and hard and closed now, down. No, I'm, I'm in blossom. You know, what does that mean? Just to sit and just to think I am a beautiful flower and blossom and I deserve to be handled kindly, with care, to be treated, you know, as if, like, I am the most beautiful thing in the world. What does that mean for us? Some of us are already there. I know some of you are already like, yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> turned itself off, <laughs> or I turned it off. <laughs> um, I, I talk about this in my work, it's about living in our full humanity and experiencing the full range of being human. Anger, grief, despair, joy, and not bypassing the, the, the big feelings in the expense of, again, caretaking to others or... or, or trying not to play into racist stereotypes. So it's about living in your full humanity. And I talk about... Um, <laughs> recently in an event, I said, I demand that people are anti-racist. And what I mean by that is treating every single human with basic human dignity and care and allowing us to have access to healing. Because if we were in that space, we wouldn't see the destruction that we see around the world. We wouldn't see the bullshit that we see happening in the workplace. We just wouldn't. We would be taking better care of one another and, you know, firstly ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah. You named, you named rage as one of, those, one of those emotions. So I thought we could drop into rage. Um, 
I think both of you talk about the very real implications of expressing rage, especially for black folks, right? Um, and, you know, for me as a psychologist in mental health services, this is very, very real. Um, you know, there are very real implications to the expressions of black rage, you know, black people being entering the mental health services through criminal justice system, you know, being over-medicated, being restrained, being much more likely to be murdered by restraint, you know, the, the overdiagnosis of psychosis, violence, basically, under the guise of care. So what does it actually mean, then? How can we build a relationship to our age, to our anger, especially for black folks, where there can be not only a processing, but isn't an expression also necessary? And then I guess, what does that, what does that look like? Mm, I mean, for me, rage is uh, anger built up over time mm -hmm. that hasn't had a vessel to be expressed. Um, and I was afraid of anger for a long time because I saw, I saw anger as violent. Mm. I also was afraid of it because of the stereotyping of angry black women. So I did everything in my power not to be angry and not to play that stereotype. And when you don't express anger, because anger is just energy, it needs a vehicle to come out. It's, otherwise it starts recycling itself. And when I did not express my anger for so many years and would just swallow and tolerate, that turned up as tumours in my body. 37 in my womb, mimicking a three-month pregnancy. And so there was a boundary I had to cross. I will not swallow this anymore because it is making me ill. And that doesn't mean me going around and harming and abusing people. But I had to learn to have a relationship with anger and to learn to express anger in a healthy way. Because also what was happening, not only was it turning itself Ill inwards as illness, and I know you talk about this in your book as well, it would come out as passive aggression. Which is not, it's not, it's not a state that I, I want to be in and it's not how I want to treat people. So the consequences of not being in touch with anger and learning how to release on a regular basis in a healthy way was making me very ill. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That's, you know, such generous emotional labor that, you know, that we have to do you know, but thank you for disclosing that. Yeah. Thank you for holding. Yeah. Yeah, we have to make space for each other. And that's what the anger needs. Like, it doesn't need us being afraid of one another when we're expressing it. It's just, we just need the space, you know? You know, because for me, I understand that for me, my anger comes from the deep brokenheartedness. Like, I'm pissed off, but actually I'm hurt. And my hurt is more than just my individual hurt, it's my community's hurt, it's my ancestors' hurt, and quite frankly, it's also the hurt of my descendants. So there's a cycle, you know, that it's just not me, it's our brokenheartedness. It is our rage arising from that brokenheartedness. Um, and how, for me, passive aggressiveness became the way that I chose to survive. I just wanted to be the nice black guy instead of being the angry black man. So I thought that's how I was gonna get through. That's how I was gonna get validation from white people. But as we have learned this week, how fragile that image is when you transcend the boundaries of being everyone's safe black man and then you turn into a violent black man. I'm not going to name any references here because I'm tired of hearing about it, but just, just as an example. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our anger, our rage is a mirror back to dominant culture, reminding them that like we're pissed off for a reason. And it's not just because we're just black and frustrated. No, it's because like we have 
we're swimming in this grief. You know, we're swimming in the grief of our ancestors who never got to be human. And persons, they were before slavery and colonization and imperialism in our homelands many centuries ago. But we lost that for those of us, you know, for our ancestors who were wrapped up, captured into the system, they, we lost our humanity. And so much of our healing is trying to get back home to ourselves, which is our homeland. You know, it's not that I'm trying to get back to Africa. Like, I'm just trying to get back here. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to get back here, right? You know, until then, I grieve. Right, I let my heart break. You know, and I choose not to be passive aggressive anymore because you deserve to see my anger. You know, my anger is important. It is functional, it is necessary. You know, you have to, you have to understand what we have survived, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, thank you. yeah, thank you. I, I'm with, um, how our current cultures aren't really practiced at tolerating expressions of grief, of despair, of anger. Um, and there's something you know, incredibly liberating about this idea of leaning into and really feeling it and mourning, because I know there's often, you, you, you distinguish between grief and mourning, mourning being very much the expressions of, the rituals of grief, right? Um, oof, like what a liberating place to be able to lean into that but are the, are the conditions there to hold it right? is the step actually then us leaning into beginning that practice so that we can slowly kind of have this domino effect of us being able to deepen our own capacity to hold our own and therefore hold another's you know I remember so what's coming up for me in hearing you say that is I remember being at uh, uh, the funeral. Gosh, a lot's coming up for me to say. <laughs> um, I remember being at the funeral of my best friend, Tanisha Bonner. And, you know, we, 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 we were, I still struggle with using the wrong tense, the same age. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very premature loss of life and I remember being at her funeral on one side were this massive subliminal joy and dancing and belly laughing and just celebrating her and being in community with one another and enjoying memories and then on the other side was just deep despair mm. and two things exist at the same time I don't think I've answered your question, but that was emerging for me as I heard you say that. Yeah. It's all part of it. It's that, that, to me, is the essence of grief. It's not always down in despair. It's all of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's everything, you know, and I'm, just, I'm interested in what it means to grieve together collective grief, you know? I'm interested in no longer taking responsibility for your fear of my brokenheartedness, mm. especially when it's just reflecting yours. And that's the kind of violence that we walk around the world with, and it's called pity. It's like, oh, you poor person, like you, you've lost your best friend, or you're just having a really hard time. Like, you are too. <laughs> You know, but we do that because we, we're trying to stay away from that broken hardness because we're still trying to be functional. Like, we have shit to do. I don't have time to sit around and grieve because grief is, it feels like a depleting energy, you know? And by God, we're in capitalism. Capitalism says we have to keep it going. No matter what's going on, like the pandemic is old news, let's, let's rev it up. <laughs> You know, it doesn't matter who's died. It doesn't matter what we've lost. It doesn't matter what's changed. Let's keep it going because the system is more important 
and being human, you know? And if we start actually acknowledging the humanity, then we have to start acknowledging our loyalty to the system because the system has helped us bypass doing emotional labor for ourselves and for others. We can just keep it professional in the system, right? Yep. You know, it's just business. Yeah. I think about kind of the complicity of mental health services within this, like big time kind of fix it mentality Mm. of how can we make you better? What does better actually mean? Well, I think it's fundamentally tied up in capitalism, which is how can we get you back to work again? (laughs) Yep. And, you know, there's so much of the very kind of risk-focused underpinning to mental health services, which is, oh, you've got a suicide plan. Are you going to die? Which is underneath that is I cannot bear to be with your wanting to die. I need to control it and make a plan out of it and put it away, out of sight. You know, there's something about that. And I, I think there's something really in reimagining a world where we could actually bear each other's suffering, embrace each other's madnesses, you know. Um, it, it, I mean, just hearing you share that, um, I worked in mental health for 10 years prior to yeah. uh, running my own business. And I remember the, the, the fear around seeing people in their madness or, you know, experiencing mental vulnerability. And I remember this, you know, the fear, well, you deal with this person. Like, I can't be around this. Right. Yeah. Um, whereas for me, regardless of the label that's been given, this is a human being that is suffering. So how can I hold space for that yes. and treat them with dignity and care in that moment? Um, mm. And we've, lo- like... I'm I'm on part of a uh, I'm part of a panel of a human rights uh, charity that is exploring racism in the NHS or mm. or exploring if it is present or not. And one of the questions I asked was how have we got to a position where caregivers have forgotten how to care? Mm. And it's everything that you've just spoken about, the capitalist element of it. Mm-hmm. And not being able to bear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, I think there's also understanding that grief and our mental health vulnerabilities is messy mm-hmm. and it's hard to name and categorize and we don't survive well when things are ambiguous, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, like, I need to know what's happening. I need to know what this is because I need to figure out who I am in relationship to this. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, and so we're always labeling things, but we label it so we know what to avoid. You know, so we say, hashtag, you're crazy. <laughs> Therefore, I'm gonna go over here because I, I can't deal with that, mm-hmm. right? But instead of saying, you know, maybe you're reflecting me. You know, maybe there's something about me that like I don't know how to hold space for because I don't have the language, but I can experience it. But that experiencing is gonna make me not functional. It's not going to make me productive anymore. You know, we're fearing that. Like, we're, we're tied into this productive machine. This, this, we're like a clog in the machine. And we don't know what it means to disrupt that, to disengage. Because we don't know who we are if we're not plugged into the machine. You know, that goes back to personhood. It's like, I need to figure out who I am and that I'm a person that deserves to be well, like regardless of what I've been told. You know? I mean, and it really comes back to this, this first piece about how we can relate to our own yeah. suffering because if people then become, you know, we're not able to bear those reflections of ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. People in absolute despair or in rage or in grief showing us the parts that we can't bear in ourselves, yeah. right? So if we can build that practice of tending to ourselves gently and being with that, it opens us up to be able to, to meet others with that same compassion, that same tenderness, right? But we can't be afraid to feel. Mm. Like, again, like feeling takes us back to our body, and for many of us, feeling is dangerous. Our bodies are off limits because we've never been told that we have a right to our bodies. You know, so to like to to have that empathy and that compassion that comes from empathy means that first and f- first and foremost, I'm touching back into my body, and all that's dangerous. You know, 
nice segue. <laughs> yeah, nice segue. There, you did it. You did it for me, Rod. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was, the, that was the next question I wanted to ask was, you know, the body in all of this, like the role of the body in this work of getting free. And systems, systems of oppression really invite us so often to engage at such an intellectual level, right? We're having all these intellectual debates about what racism is, but we ain't got no idea what's happening in our body, right? And the abundance of wisdom in the body, the knowing that is unlanguaged, right? So could you both, I know this is really key in both of your work, yeah. um, both of you in both of your books really emphasise this piece of bringing the body into the work. So could you both share a little bit about the relevance of the body in the work of liberation? Mm, yeah, thank you. Um, it's interesting because I was always, in my teaching, uh, before, 20, before, before Black Square Summer in 2020, um, I was always talking about, like, pay attention to your body. Your body is wise. And what, what, what is it communicating with you? If you're, in a, if, you're in a, if you're in a situation where you are not under physical threat, but yet your heart is pounding out of your chest and your hands are sweating and you're tightening your jaw, like, pay attention to your body. And I was always doing that, and I'm very... Um, I have a lot of body intuition naturally. I used to be a dancer. Who knows whether that's, that's part of it or not. But I am very connected to my body. And when I'm stressed, I get a physical manifestation of that. And it wasn't until Black Square Summer where I found language for what I was already doing. And, and I heard terms like somatic abolitionism. I was like, huh? wow, OK. I... I was just doing this, and it goes back to it's ancestral. It's what we were doing before the interruption of slavery, and we were paying attention to intelligences other than the cognitive and giving them as much value and weight um, to be aware of what is being communicated to us outside of words. Um, and for me personally, it's, it's, it's necessary for me in order to learn to have a relationship with anger and express anger healthfully when I've just delivered a talk or a workshop and I've got microaggressions in the questions or, you know, re resistance or violence to really embody how to express anger healthfully. And so sometimes that's screaming in a pillow <laughs> if one is accessible. <laughs> growling. Um, I sing a lot. I do lots of therapeutic shaking, brushing stuff off that isn't mine, um, dancing, vocalizing. Ah! Um, and I do it whilst I'm driving, whilst I'm walking down the road. And I don't care what people are saying because I'm releasing that from my body. It's energy and then it's gone and it's not recycling. And So that's just a a couple of I, a couple of ways that I use embodiment to help me, um, but also in my teaching, I'm encouraging people to. Uh, Rev Angel Kiyoda says this all the time: um, return to ourselves and just pay attention, because our bodies are wise. My body was communicating with me for years that something was not wrong, and I was just carrying on. Yeah. yeah. That was so rich, Nova. Thank you. Yeah, I think having examples of how people engage in such different ways, I think it offers a freedom for us to lean into what feels right for our own bodies and really kind of tune into that. Yeah. What about you, Rod? Yeah. Um, I've mentioned some of this before, but I think first I'll say, you know, one of the obstacles that we're working with is that where we've been conditioned to distrust our bodies, to, I would say, even hate our bodies, right? And if you can get someone to hate their body, you control them, you know? And then you can wrap them up in systems of oppression, you know, because there's a, there's a disembodiment here, you know? And for me, I got into yoga years ago because I was interested in what it meant to come back to the body. What was that union? like, you know, and it's still a project that I'm working on, absolutely, you know, but to, again, to see my body as this vehicle towards liberation, for liberation, right? I can't get free 
unless my body is allying with me, accompanying me towards that experience of freedom. None of us will get free without the body, you know, because we can't get free fragmented. Like wholeness is when that door opens. Not just the union of awareness and body, but when everything comes together and we say, oh, okay, this is the totality of everything. Now I can take that step into understanding the nature of things, right? The essence of things. That's when I. That's what I mean by liberation. Is when I enter into the truth of everything, you know. And the truth of everything is that my body is here. I have this body. I am inhabiting this physical form, and I have learned to hold space for both the pleasure and the displeasure. Right, everything together, both the good and the bad. You take them both, and then you have the facts of life. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know where I don't know what that came from, but anyway, (laughs) yeah. But I, I think about the Buddha too. For me, the Buddha realized in his enlightenment work that like he couldn't get he couldn't awaken without the body he thought he could just put the body to the side and then realize he wasn't getting anywhere so he had to come back to the body right you know and for me it it just reminded me that the body isn't this obligation it's not this inconvenience it is a part of who i am in this form and the relative Right? And it deserves as much love as part of myself as anyone else deserves love. Right? But some of us aren't ready for that. For that love. If you're not ready for that love, you're not ready to get free. Yep. You ready for that love? Yeah. Good. I have a program. You know? <laughs> For a hundred pounds a month, (laughs) you too can get free. (laughs) You know, because if you vote for me, I'll set you free. (laughs) (laughs) You're about to guide us through a sit, yeah, after that. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to do a practice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Is it time already? Yeah, Yeah, it's an hour. it's It's flowing so quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's been an hour. I know. I'm not ready either. I'm not ready, but... Yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes. Should we do a sit or do or questions? What would you prefer? Yeah, what would you prefer? A, a question, a couple of minutes for questions or for Rod to guide us through a, a sit? Yeah. yeah. Sit. Okay, sure. <laughs> Cheers, I'm a professional. This is what I do, so here we go. <laughs> So, you know, just continue to sit in the same way you've been sitting, you know. Don't become a a professional meditator like I know some of you are. I'm like, get ready. (laughs) No, just sit. And as you're sitting, I just invite you to shift your attention to noticing the seat under you. Noticing the weight of your body making contact with the seat. And so there's a sensation there of the body being held by the seat, your body being held by your seat. And I wonder if you can allow that sensation or that anchor to gently hold your attention. As if you're coming home to being held by the seat. And I wonder if you can even trust the seat to hold you. And so noticing the earth under us, the ground, the floor, which is an extension of the earth, how the earth, the land is holding everything. And the earth is the energy of 
stability, foundation, groundedness. And I wonder if we can just touch into this energy, beginning to understand that our bodies are extensions of the earth. And therefore, our bodies can experience the same stability, groundedness, and foundation. And when you're ready, I invite you to shift your attention into reflection. And I just invite you to reflect on something that you're grateful for. Maybe someone that you're grateful for or just the gratitude that you have for all the labor and care you've been offered. Maybe in our time together or any time today or any time in your life, just reflecting on what what you've been offered that has helped you survive, that's helped you deepen in joy or love or happiness, or what you've been given to get freer. Allowing the experience and energy of gratitude to awaken within your body. Feeling that energy of gratitude completely fill you up. And imagining Imagining that this energy of gratitude is just overflowing, radiating out of your body, filling the earth with gratitude, filling the world with gratitude. Just being grateful. And when you're ready, just allowing yourself to enter back into the space, slowly opening your eyes, maybe moving through some slow, gentle stretches and movements to reawaken the body. And of course, in this state of awakened gratitude, remembering the generous labor of those who've just offered to you and just making sure you know where your wallet is. (laughs) Amen, because we're gonna be be passing this collection plate around. We're gonna be doing three offerings. First offering, a love offering. (laughs) Second offering, (laughs) a gratitude offering. (laughs) (laughs) What should I? What should I sing? Um, Oh, this little. Okay, and that's the third offering, which is (laughs) my tip. (laughs) Okay, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine In this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This 
this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Yes. Yes, sexual chocolate. <laughs>